Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers. Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Good to have you here. It's Tuesday. Hope you've had a great day wherever you are in this big world. We're going to get started, but first, you know the drill. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to hit subscribe if you haven't already. Like the video, share it with your friends, and you can ring my bell if you want notifications of when I post new content. Just click that bell icon. It'll let you know when new things are up on the YouTube channel. Music fact of the day, the song Eight Days a Week. Paul McCartney was on his way to John Lennon's house for a songwriting session. Paul was talking to the chauffeur that was driving him out that day, and he asked how he had been. The chauffeur said, oh, working hard, working eight days a week. Paul had never heard that expression before, so when he got to John's house, he said, hey, this fella just said eight days a week, and John said, right, oh, I need your love, babe. And they went on to write the song. I've spent a good part of the day reading transcripts of Scott's trial and also looking through exhibits that they introduced. And I found Amber's testimony from his trial. And I know yesterday we talked about jumping into those wiretaps today. Now, believe me, they have 29 hours of calls. We're definitely not going verbatim over every one. I've been going in and picking out kind of the best parts. But in reading her testimony from the trial, I thought instead of jumping into the wiretaps today, why don't we go through her testimony at trial? Because it really gives the full backstory of their relationship. And one thing to note about their relationship is even though it seems like it maybe went on forever, Scott and Amber were only around each other physically four times. They actually spent more time with her wiretapping the calls than they were a couple. So it wasn't this months long affair. It was just one that started fast and furious. And a lot of that is due to Scott's lies and telling her he wanted a commitment. He wasn't married. She's looking for somebody that's a forever partner. It was like a fuse lit if you look at it from her perspective. I think that's one thing that the defense really wanted to get across to those jurors is not only was this a very short lived affair, but not only that, they felt like Amber really was trying to rope Scott in with these wiretaps, but that's kind of the point. Now, don't get me wrong. I think Mark Gargos is a great attorney. I mean, he's kind of a wizard in the courtroom, but I think her testimony really tipped the scales in the favor of the prosecution because up to that point, a lot of legal analysts felt like the state's case was actually really weak. And there was talk, this is maybe going to be a hung jury because there's just no slam dunk here. There's no aha. There's pieces to the puzzle that seem to fit. But Amber's testimony really was what I think solidified in a way that guilty verdict for Scott because these wiretaps, y'all, if you've never listened to them, and I, I've listened to most. I mean, I've been putting them on in the car. I've been hearing them in my sleep. They're creepy. I mean, when you know the backstory and you know the context to hear Scott talk the way he does to Amber, he has no clue he's being wiretapped, so he's very open about things, it is just unbelievable to think side by side, you have this investigation into his wife and unborn son's disappearance. And yet every night, like around 10 p.m., he calls to sweet talk Amber. So what I'm going to do instead of doing the wiretaps today is tell her story through her testimony. If Scott were to get a new trial, I mean, I bet you anything, Amber will be back on that stand. And Amber at this point has moved on. I, I saw some things that were more recent of her. She's beautiful. She looks very happy, and that's good because she deserves it, right? Not only was she outed as being the other woman without knowing she was the other woman, there were things that happened later on that were just devastating to her, and we'll get into that in a future episode. I am just going to replay the slideshow that I had from yesterday. I just haven't had time to replace the pictures, and to be honest, there's not a lot of pictures out there that I haven't used. Amber and Scott first talked on the phone about meeting up when he was coming through town for business. We know her friend Sean was the one that sort of set them up, and Sean was able to watch Amber's daughter for her when she went on this first date. Amber and Scott had conversations setting up the date. They were describing what they looked like. Scott joked he wasn't very tall. He was overweight with the belly and said he had long, greasy hair. The first date was November 20th of 2002. Scott showed up to the bar and Amber was sitting in a little waiting area. Scott walked up to the door, opened it, had a grin on his face. He was dressed nice. He was in a suit and he said, Amber, she said, Scott. So he said he was nervous about meeting her, but he felt a lot better since it was over. 
They talked about riding in the same car, which would be his truck, to the Japanese restaurant they had made plans to go to. Scott said he had worked all day and hadn't had a chance to check into his hotel room yet, so he asked Amber if she would go with him while he checked in, and also he wanted to change clothes, so she agreed. She said Scott was cheerful and happy and made her feel very comfortable right out of the gate. Once they got to the hotel room, Scott pulled some champagne out of a brown leather duffel bag and poured them both a glass. He went on to take a shower, and then he came out dressed, and then he pulled out some chocolate-covered strawberries and put one in each of their glasses. They left the hotel and went to dinner at this Japanese restaurant. And once they sat down, Scott excused himself and said he would be right back. He came back and told Amber he had got a private room for the two of them to have their dinner in. She said it was a sliding door. It's one of those places you essentially sit on the floor to eat. Amber said during dinner, Scott was very easygoing and he made her feel comfortable. He wasn't wearing his wedding band, of course. And we know he never told Amber he was married and had a baby on the way. Amber said they just talked in general about their lives, what she did for a living, which she was a massage therapist and she was about to make a move to go on her own. And they talked about their interests. Amber told Scott that her daughter's birthday and her birthday were only 10 days apart. And Scott told her about his business at Trade Corps. He told her he had a warehouse in Modesto, but said he lived in Sacramento. Scott told her he owned a condominium in San Diego, and also for Thanksgiving, he was going fishing in Alaska. Then for Christmas, he would join his parents in Maine, and then from there, he would go to Europe over the holidays. She said they stayed at the restaurant about two to three hours. From the restaurant, they went next door to a karaoke bar. Scott ordered two drinks, and they sat down and just had some more conversation. Well, Scott wanted her to get up and sing. He said he heard her singing in the hotel and thought she had a great voice. The two of them looked over some songs together, and they both got up to sing. We've never heard what song they sung. Color me curious. They also slow danced and kissed while at the karaoke bar. She said they stayed there pretty much until closing time, and so from the karaoke bar, they went to a grocery store and then back to his hotel room. They talked some more, and ultimately, she spent the night with him, and the next morning, Scott took Amber back to her car. Amber expressed to Scott that she felt really awkward. They had been intimate so quickly. Scott reassured her it was okay. Of course you did, Scott. Scott made a comment to her about having to leave that next week after meeting each other to go with his family for Thanksgiving. But he would keep in contact, and he said he wasn't good on the phone, but would make every effort to try to talk to her. Amber didn't have a landline, and at the time, she didn't have the internet at home. Their only means of communication were with her cell phone. Later that day, after he dropped her off to her car, he called and said he wanted to see her again before he left, but ultimately, that didn't pan out. He calls her after Thanksgiving and left a message saying that he had been looking through a California hiking guide and for her to think of somewhere to go, or he wanted to know if she had somewhere in mind for their second date. Eventually, they connect on the phone, and they decide to go to a place called Squall's Leap. It's in the mountains. You go hiking. They had talked about hiking actually on their first date. So on December 2nd, they go hike, and Amber brought her daughter along this time because Scott wanted to meet her. Scott came over to her house, and they hugged. He handed her a plant and also a bag of groceries because he had been shopping, bought ingredients to cook her dinner that night. He came inside the house. They put the groceries away, and then Scott asked where her little one is. Well, her daughter was at school, and they talked a while, but she didn't remember exactly what they talked about. She said at that point, they both put a car seat in his truck and leave to go pick up his daughter. From there, they go to Squall's Leap. Scott had brought things for them to have a picnic, so he grabbed that bag and headed to the river. There was a bridge there. Once they get there, Scott pulls out a blanket and food. She said he brought carrots, almonds, cookies, and some drinks. Amber said they talked, and it was a chilly day. Her daughter was just kind of munching on snacks, but as it got colder, they decided to walk back. Now, our daughter didn't want to walk because she was tired, so Amber picks her up and starts to carry her, but she gets winded because the hike back was uphill. So Scott offered to carry her daughter back to the car, and he did the rest of the way. Once they got back to the car, it was getting dark, so they made up a little contest to see who could spot the first star. So they laid down in the bed of the truck for a while, and Scott was the one that spotted the first star. After that, they left. They go back to her place. Scott starts cooking that seafood lasagna he had got the ingredients for, and he was interacting with her daughter. They ate. Scott pulls out a bottle of wine and opens it. 
Amber tells Scott about a friend who saves all the corks and writes on that cork who she drank that bottle of wine with and the date. Amber actually did the same thing that night with the cork from that bottle of wine Scott brought. Talked about them not saving that cork from their very first date, but Scott commented there would be many more bottles to come. Scott walked outside after dinner and had something behind his back. Then he asked Amber if he could have her permission to give her daughter a gift, and Amber said that was fine. Amber said it was a book that was wrapped up. Later that evening, Amber brought out a photo album that she had made for her daughter's first year. At the end of the evening, Scott mentions, oops, I haven't checked into my hotel. So Amber told him he could stay with her, and he did. The next day, December 3rd, he told Amber he had business somewhere south that day in the Bakersfield or Santa Maria area. They talked about him coming back over to her house when he finished for the day. Amber had a client that was going to be late. So before Scott left, they had talked about him picking up Amber's daughter from school if he finished his work in time. Scott told her he would be honored. So she left Scott her house key as well as the car seat. When Amber got home around 630, Scott had her daughter in the high chair and the little girl had food in front of her. Scott was taking out bread he had toasted and he was warming the leftovers from the dinner the night before. He had also poured the both of them a glass of wine. Over dinner, they talk and decide to go to a Christmas tree farm. Scott, Amber, and Amber's daughter go to the tree farm in his truck and pick out a tree. Once they got back to Amber's house, Scott brought the tree in and Amber pulls out a box of ornaments and explains to Scott that her tree really doesn't have a theme, but each ornament had a significance to her and she was explaining that to him. And at some point while they were decorating the tree, Amber asked Scott if he's ever been married, and he says no. So she asked about children. Do you have children? He said no, and he was not close to wanting to have one. Again, Scott spent the night over at Amber's. He left on December 4th. Scott said he had to work, and also that weekend he had plans to go out on a boat with some friends. Scott called her that week, and again on December 9th, Scott said he wanted to see her. Amber said, I'm home. He asked if she had any plans, and if she did, don't wait around, but he wanted to come over, and he was only 20 minutes away. Amber told him to come on over. She sees him pull him from the window, so she goes out to greet him. Scott takes her hand and says he needs to talk to her. And she said something seemed different about him. His demeanor was off. So as they're walking into her house, Scott mentions he may have done something terrible to a possibly beautiful relationship. Scott goes into the kitchen and he pulls out two chairs, one for each of them. She said Scott was crying and said he lied when he said he had never been married. He said sometimes when people ask, it's just easier for him to say he hadn't been married, but he lied and he had lost his wife. Amber asked how long it had been. He just said it would be his first holiday without her. So Amber just thanked him for sharing that with her and said it must be painful. She told Scott she understands it was hard for him to tell her. Scott told Amber she was amazing. He was intrigued by her and also her response. At that point, Amber asked if he was really ready for a relationship, and he said absolutely. She said Scott seemed relieved after talking to her. The tears stopped, and he calmed down. They had made plans to see each other again on December 11th for a birthday party at her friend Sean's house. This, by the way, 13 days before Lacey disappears. Now, in between then, on the 10th, Amber's daughter had an accident where she needed stitches. Scott came over the next day on the 11th. He seems happy and normal. He interacted with her daughter. And Amber told Scott that her daughter's bandage needed to be changed and asked him if he would do it. So he does. They leave and go to the party. Her daughter comes with them. This is the first time Amber had been together with Sean and Scott in the same room. Scott didn't know anybody at the party other than Amber and Sean. But Scott was very personable and interactive with everybody there. There's a photo here up on the screen. This is a picture of Scott and Amber at that party that somebody took of them. I cropped it just to take everybody else out of that picture. There were several people in the background. Amber was showing Scott some photos. This is back when, you know, we had to actually go develop our film and didn't have it instantly on our phones. They left the party and they planned to see each other again on December 14th. That was for a formal Christmas party at a friend's house. Amber isn't sure if it was before or after the birthday party, but they went to a tux rental place. Scott told Amber he wasn't sure if he could make it due to business, but Amber said she was going anyways. 
with or without him. Remember, Scott told Amber on December 9th that he had lost his wife. This was after Sean's party, but before the formal. So Amber and Scott talk about Scott being married. Amber finds out that Scott told Sean he had been married before he told her, and that bothered her. Now, we know what really happened is Sean finds out he was married and tells Scott that either you can tell Amber or I'm going to tell her. So that's where this whole lost my wife story came up. Scott told Amber he had planned to share that with her after his trip to Europe, but he knew it wasn't the right thing and he should have told her before. But she said knowing that Sean knew before her, it made her change her way of thinking as to why Scott told her when he did. Moving on to December 14th. This is 10 days before Lacey goes missing. Just a reminder here, Lacey and Scott did have a Christmas party they were going to together that night, but Scott went with Amber. Lacey went alone. And there is this recognizable picture of Lacey sitting alone in a chair in a red outfit. Scott comes to the door and greets Amber with a dozen roses and gives her a hug. He tells Amber he hoped she had more vases because he pulls out two more dozen roses. She puts those in water and Scott had one in his hand. She asked what that's for. Scott said, I'm glad you asked. So he asked if she had a candle and some scissors. So he goes to cut the stem off the rose. Now the lights are out. It's dimly lit in there. He starts rubbing the rose on her face and on her chest and he said he didn't know personally what that felt like, but he thought it would be romantic. So they kiss and they start getting ready for the formal. She said they were in and out of a few rooms and Scott tells her, if she hears banging in the kitchen, do not worry, but don't come in there. When he finally allows her to come in there, he gives her a pink lady caramel apple. So Amber tells the story of how she told Scott prior to this date that she and Scott were in Whole Foods and they passed a pink lady caramel apple stand. And the year before, back in August, Amber was getting her braces off and the first thing she wanted was a pink lady caramel apple. She said she never got one. She did buy a caramel apple, but not a pink lady. Big difference, if you don't know, by the way. She says Scott had individual caramels. He melted in a pan, then he dipped the apple in it. And he said he hadn't done that before, so he wasn't sure how it was going to taste. They talk about how they should refer to each other at this party. Scott said he was monogamous and they should refer to one another as lover. But Amber didn't think that sounded very appropriate. And he said, well, how about my love? She said that sounded good. Before they left for the formal, they took photos of them getting ready. These are up on the screen here. There are selfies of her sitting on his lap, a photo of Scott putting on his tie. He's on Amber's cell phone. They leave for the formal. And they go to pick up a friend of Amber's named Saki. Saki and Amber had decided a couple of weeks before that they were going to this party together. So they go to her house. They took more photos at Saki's place. And Amber said they didn't take any pictures of that formal. Now at the trial, they showed the ones of Scott and Amber, a couple of them in the front seat of his truck, one in front of the Christmas tree, one in front of the bathroom. All of these photos here were taken by Saki at her house. The party was at a place called World Sports Cafe in Fresno. And at the party, Scott handed out Amber's business cards that she had made specifically for that party because she was starting her own massage therapy business. Amber said someone at one point thought Scott was the massage therapist. Scott corrected the person and said, no, it's my girlfriend. She said they were affectionate at the party and she felt their relationship was really starting to blossom at this point. After the party, they dropped Saki back at her house and then went to Amber's. She said that night they were intimate, but they did not use protection. Later on, Scott apologized for that, and they talked about different birth control methods as well as their thoughts on having children. Scott told her he didn't feel the need to have a biological child, and if they were together, he would consider Amber's daughter his own, and he would raise her as if she were his. Scott actually brought up having a vasectomy, and she was concerned because he was so young, but willing to make a decision that was so permanent that it bothered her. Scott left on December 15th. This is nine days before Lacey disappeared. Scott told Amber he had to take care of some business before leaving on this long trip that was fake over the holidays. Before he left, Amber gave Scott a Christmas card, and also in that was a photo of her with her daughter. She wrote on the card, To my love. I'll be keeping you close to my heart with love, Amber. Scott tells her he wouldn't be back until the end of January. And this is what's weird. This would be the last time Amber saw Scott until the day she testified at his trial. But they continue to talk on the phone. And she asked him if she could trust him with her heart. He told Amber she had the answer to that. 
Here's what's weird, and I can't find the card, and I can't find the context, but Scott mailed the Christmas card back to Amber as well as a letter from him. You have to wonder at this point, did Lacey start suspecting he was having an affair? Because you have to consider he's spending days away from home. And if he's with Amber, I wonder if he was talking to Lacey at all. That goes into another theory for motive, is did Lacey confront him about this affair right before she disappeared? We'll never know. On December 16th, Scott left Amber a voicemail. She eventually would play this voicemail for investigators after she contacted police when finding out Scott was married and his wife is missing. The voicemail said, Hey, sweetheart, Scott here. It's 545. I was just giving you a call. I'm driving to the gym here to do my weekly five-minute workout. See how you're doing. Try to call you tomorrow. Bye. She left a message for him the next day. December 17th, one week before Lacey disappears. She told Scott in the voicemail something happened that upset her. She wanted to talk to him. He did end up calling her back. They don't say what the context of the conversation was. Next, they talk on the 19th, five days before Lacey goes missing. Scott said he was either in New Mexico or Arizona. She couldn't quite remember. On December 22nd, he told her he was leaving Sacramento and flying to Maine to meet his parents and would be there until the 28th. On December 23rd, he called Amber in the morning and said he was going on a guided duck hunt with his dad. He told Amber they were actually on the way as he was talking to her. Amber asked Scott where she could send something to him to. So he tells her to get a pen and gives her a P.O. box that's in Modesto. They talk again on the 23rd, and they had a conversation about a doctor's appointment for birth control pills. She told Scott a date that she could see her doctor about getting pills, and she said since he was going to be gone for a while, it would be a good time to start those. Scott also brought up having a vasectomy again and said they could set a date where they could go in together to meet with a doctor to discuss if it was permanent, if it's reversible. And Amber said at this point she was upset because it's permanent, and at some point, she probably would want more kids. So she gets upset and starts to cry. Scott tells her not to. Then he said he wishes he was there to comfort her. Ultimately, they changed topics. She didn't hear from Scott on the 24th, the day Lacey goes missing. But she did hear from him on the 25th. It was around 9 p.m. She said she heard a woman's voice in the background. Scott told Amber it was his mother coming down to sit beside him. But he tells Amber he told his mom no. And then it made her sad. Amber said that made her feel bad. They end up talking about a nursery rhyme about five little ducks that go out to play. Scott told Amber the next time he saw her, he wanted to have her sing that for him. That's a little weird. On the 26th, just for context, this is the day of the search warrant at Scott and Lacey's house. And also the day the volunteer command post was established. Amber tried to call Scott several times, but wasn't able to get him. She wanted to talk about a package of Christmas presents that she got from him that was delivered to her house. There was one of those star theater planetarium lights that put stars on your wall. And there was an invoice in there with a message written in small letters in Spanish at the very bottom. Now, I translated this and it said, the stars for my ladies of heaven. Where is the first star? Y'all, this guy lays it on thick. It's scary because look, he's, I think he's a psychopath, but like he's smooth. Look how many women he fooled over the years. And I don't think Amber and Janet were the only two that he cheated on Lacey with. There's no way he went years in between. These women probably just don't want their name associated with this guy. The next day on the 27th, just for context, the police had a press conference. Lacey's family goes live pleading for her safe return this is that press conference where Ron just got so upset he doubled over. Amber calls Scott, and there's a hang-up. So she called again, and he answered. Scott told her he would be in Boston to catch a flight to Paris. She was surprised he answered because he was supposed to have been on a flight at that point, and she thought that she would just be leaving him a message. But, of course, Scott has a reason. There was a delay, and he decided to spend the day in New York City. She said she was upset he didn't call to let her know. She said they had planned to talk later that day. And Scott said because of the delay, he was given a gift certificate or $100, one of the two, and he chose to get a meal and a massage. He told Amber he was heading to get the massage as they were on the phone. At this point, Amber said she started to get a little suspicious. Initially, she got suspicious when he gave her a Modesto post office box when he's supposed to be overseas. She was having trust issues about his whereabouts in general, and she told him this. 
She apologized to him for feeling that way, and he told her not to, and that he should be more sensitive to her feelings and more considerate. A couple hours later, they talk again, and Scott told Amber he was at the airport in New York getting ready for that flight. Scott gave Amber a different cell phone number he said he used when he traveled. December 28th, this is the day the Berkeley Marina is searched for the first time. Amber dropped off some photos to be printed and calls a friend who told her to stop by. Now, in the past, Amber had talked to this friend about some trust issues that she was starting to have with Scott. This person also had a roommate who talked about this mistrust issue with her. Now, on December 29th, Amber goes to a party. She got a call from a friend that she had previously talked to about Scott and her concerns. And this is when she finds out about Lacey and Scott. The call was around 1 a.m. and immediately after this call was over, Amber hangs up and calls the Modesto Police Department. Don't quote me on this number, but it was super quick. I believe maybe there was three minutes between when she got that incoming call to when she was dialing the Modesto PD. She wasn't sure if she was calling about the same Scott Peterson. She asked if they could confirm it that it was Scott Peterson. So Amber gave his age, his birthday, the type of business he ran. Ultimately, they confirm, yep, Scott Peterson. So Amber proceeded to tell the dispatcher, I've been seeing Scott. He's in Paris or Europe. And she just kind of spilled the beans about their relationship. She didn't hear anything back that morning. So again, she calls the Modesto PD. She gets another dispatcher. She was told Al Brocchini, who was a detective on the case, would be calling, but he hadn't as of then. Just so happened, he's passing by as the woman is taking this call. So he picks it up. After the call, she met with detectives within a couple of hours, and she shows them photos of her and Scott, allows them to take the photos. This is when they ask if she would be willing to cooperate. She says yes. We know they go to Radio Shack to get the devices to record these conversations, and they talked about when Scott would call, she would inform the police he had called, and then she would give the tapes to him. So tomorrow, we'll actually pick up on these wiretaps. We're not going to go deep into them. I think we may do one episode on them because we could go for two weeks. And it's kind of the same old stuff regurgitated. A lot of Scott's answers are, I can't talk about it right now. Can't say no more. I tell you, man, I was thinking about Scott's family. And I know a lot of people don't like the Petersons. And in true crime, you sort of see by default, a lot of true crime followers just don't like the defendant's family due to that whole DNA thing. And they're related. But I always try to look at it from a personal perspective you know i have a brother who i adore he's great give you the shirt off his back one of the kindest humans you'll ever meet if he were accused of something like this i can't say i wouldn't be defending him 20 years later either on the same token you think about lacy's family you know it's a very exciting time lacy's weeks away from giving birth to her first child you know her mom was excited to see her go through these steps of motherhood and then you get that one call and it's such a reminder that we're all one phone call away from the rest of our lives being changed. Every case we cover starts with a notification at the door or a phone call. Not only that, she's pregnant and they're defending Scott in the media for a while until Amber comes into the picture. And you think about the layers of what they had to deal with, the loss, not knowing is she kidnapped somebody holding her captive? Is she dead? You, I think you always hold out hope there'll be a happy ending. But, you know, as the days and weeks tick by, we know how these things usually end. But then they have to be told, guess what? The marriage you thought your daughter had with Scott was a lie. And he is a liar. And he's been cheating. And if you remember on that very first episode, as soon as Lacey's mom saw that picture, her first thing that she said, why did he have to kill her? So I just think about both sides of the family and the struggles that they've had because they're all human you know it's the same time scott's family lost lacy too and it seems like they loved her it just goes to show you that these crimes are so far reaching yeah my mind's been swirling about this case because i've been down a big old rabbit hole and i hope you guys have a good rest of your evening and we'll see you soon